Hey everybody, welcome back to this introduction to logic. Uh, Andrew here. Um, all right, so let me uh, play the track. Um, I'm in the same session that uh, I left off last time. Uh, let's hear where we're at. Uh, so far we just have piano and this electro bump drum kit. So, I mean, it's a, not super interesting, but it's a four bar loop for us to start with. So I'm gonna attempt to build out a, a beat here, um, you could say, um, and I'm gonna address some advanced MIDI functions, um, some audio editing, um, let's see, some MIDI draw. And uh, before I begin, I want to address just setting up a our logic system. So logic has some uh, advanced editing um, options as they call it and these uh, advanced editing options um, enable um, us to do certain things. Now logic comes with them disabled and it does that because some of them involve destructive editing. So what that means is uh, reversing an audio clip is a, an example of a destructive edit. If you don't uh, duplicate and change the file that you're going to reverse, it's actually going to reverse the original audio file, hence the um, the term destructive. You are destroying uh, the original audio file. Um, so be careful uh, after we get this going, but um, it's important that you do this step or else you're not going to see the same options that I have here. So to access this stuff, we're going to go into Logic's drop-down menu, and we're going to go to Preference, um, Advanced Tools. Now, I suggest um, just clicking this Enable All button right here. Um, that's going to, again, um, uh, enable, or we're going to actually see all these different options. Um, like I mentioned, enables destructive audio editing, um, surround audio production. Um, I'm I'm not going to address that in this video, but if you were to want to write something um, in uh, surround sound mix, uh, you would need that enabled. Uh, MIDI, real-time uh, processing of MIDI inputs and environments, um, control surfaces, score. Um, score is somewhat optional, but I like being able to um, switch between that so I could show a trained musician the score version of the MIDI, and then finally advanced editing. Um, all right, so once you click Enable All, click Out, it might say Applying the Functions. All right, so let's get going here. Um, first of all, um, I want to uh, map out this uh, track. So uh, I'm going to work a little bit like differently in this video than I might um, otherwise, uh, but for the purpose of covering things that you should know about. So if I go up here and I click uh, this show hide global tracks button. It's gonna bring up this option um, where I have markers, I can make arrangement notes, and then this is how we would change the actual tempo or the time signature. So if you're somebody that wants to write a slightly more sophisticated piece of music that changes tempo or um, time signature, uh, this is how you would do it. Um, all right, so let me address the markers. Wherever my playhead is, when I click this plus button, it's going to create a marker. So I'm going to create a marker on the first beat. Um, notice it just drags it out. Uh, it's automatically going to do to the end of the session um, until I add another marker. All right, so zoom back in. Again, uh, I covered this in the last video, but the way I'm uh, zooming in and out like this, I'm holding option on the keyboard and using a uh, the scrolling wheel on my magic mouse. <laughs> All right, so um, this marker one, I'm going to double click here. I'm going to write intro. All right, this is a great idea um, for when you're working on a song. Uh, I wouldn't really do this beforehand, but I'm going to map out what I'm going to do here, basically. Um, The reason this is uh, really helpful, especially if you're working on someone else's song or something where 
the structure is somewhat confusing or you want to be able to hop between sections and know exactly like where to hop, um, this is helpful. Uh, when I hold um, Option, I can copy the same chorus marker just so I don't have to write it again. Um, and then I could copy my verse extending. Uh, what I'm doing here is that where it grays out, that's the end of the of the actual song, the track. So I'm gonna give us some more room after that chorus. Let's do a bridge. Um, and then let's go back to our chorus. All right, so um, for those of you that have had a lesson with me or uh, read my book or are just familiar with popular music, uh, this is a pretty standard structure for a pop song. In fact, the most standard, uh, verse one, chorus, verse two, chorus again, a bridge, and then chorus twice as long. We could add an outro here, or we could just end the track. Um, so that's addressing using uh, markers. If I wanted to do a tempo change just while I'm in this window, I would just click um, where I want that change to be, and then I can actually alter the tempo. Um, that is uh, something that, you know, most songs don't actually change tempo too much. Um, but if you want to, uh, by all means, go for it. Uh, experimentation is the secret to progress. So uh, time signature change, uh, I could do the same thing. Um, that way, uh, the way I could actually change it is if I go up here to my signature and I put three, notice it changes. Uh, where the playhead is. All right, I'm gonna leave that the same. Cool. So now let's just uh, copy these chords over and I'm gonna show you how to use some simple functions to create some variation here. All right, so let's just copy, say that our intro is our verse. All right, so first of all, um, some key commands. Uh, these uh, commands, come with uh, logic or default. So if I grab all these midis, I can hit Command J. If I hold my Command button, that is how I access the secondary tool. So if you look right here, the tool on the left is the tool we're seeing. Tool on the right is the tool that is enabled again when we hold Command. Uh, believe this is default and I, I like this setup. It's great for arranging uh, anytime you're chopping stuff and wanting to chop, move, chop, move. All right, cool. I'm going to hit Command J again to join up these uh, various MIDI clips. All right, so uh, let's get into an advanced function. Um, if I want to, so let's do a couple. Um, first of all, this is a piano. Um, Pianos, for those of you that aren't piano players, uh, you might not know this, but uh, there's pedals. If we look at that photo right there, see that little thing? It's got a foot pedal. Um, different, the most common pedal we're going to use is called the sustain pedal. What that does is it drags out, um, it sustains, it uh, makes the notes hold until you lift the pedal. So if I want to write that in, here's how I do that. I go up to my, I'm in my MIDI clip that I want to access. Up here I go view, view MIDI draw. All right, so we're gonna talk about two MIDI functions here. We've got MIDI draw and MIDI transform. MIDI transform is gonna be automatic stuff, um, such as making this twice as fast, making it uh, half the speed, um, make it reversing the position. Let's see what else. Um, humanizing, randomizing certain elements. Um, and I'll address why uh, we'll, we want to do that. So first I'm going to go into view MIDI draw. I'm going to access my sustain pedal. All right. That brings up this empty um, thing. Now the sustain pedal for the most part, like you're either pressing it or you're not. Um, logic allows you to have some subtle variation in how much it's pressed, um, but it kind of jumps around, uh, and I feel like that 
makes sense because it's when you if you play with a sustain pedal, you know you're kind of holding it. You can hold it partially down, but it really creates a similar sound anyway. So let's get our sustains in here. What I'm doing is double clicking because what this does is it holds out uh, the note. Every time this goes down to zero, it's going to reset. It's going to lift off the sustain pedal. I want to do that when I change chords. Um, you cannot do that while you change chords to get a washy sort of uh, sound where the chords blend over each other. But for this, I'm using the sustain pedal to smooth out my performance and mimic what a human being would do. All right, so now that I have already done, um, I guess I have to do this one. I've done four measures. You could keep going by hand, um, but it can be a lot better to select them all. I do that without pressing anything, dragging. I'm going to hold Option, click on uh, one of these moments. It's going to drag it out, and then I can match it up. Notice that that's not fully correct. I can just grab that line. Oh, whoops. Better make sure my sustain comes off in between those changes. All right. There we go. So let's hear what that did for us. Cool. Let's compare that with uh, our other clip, which does not have that. Notice uh, these li vertical lines on the MIDI clip. Um, Logic does that so you can visually see where you have MIDI draw in there. Um, that's especially useful if this line isn't showing. Um, sometimes it could be hidden there, so luckily we get to see that that's happening. Um, so here is without sustain pedal. And let's go with width. super subtle. Now, depending upon what virtual instrument we're working with um, or what the articulation of our chords is, that can definitely uh, impact it more. All right, so for a keyboard performance like this or virtual performance, um, adding sustain pedal goes a long way to mimic what a human being would do. Now, if we think about what the way a human being would approach the, the instrument, um, they would attempt to play like this. They would attempt to hit all of the keys um, on a downbeat, um, but uh, what you may know if you've ever looked at or uh, seen someone, a recording of a live instrumentalist, even if they're phenomenal, uh, it's not going to be perfect. So uh, one thing that tells our ears that virtual instruments are fake is that it is perfect. So we want to ironically make this less perfect. All right. Um, so I'm going to grab everything and to make it less perfect, uh, or in other words, more human-like, we are going to go over here to function. MIDI transform, all right, humanize. All right, like it sounds, this is going to make this digital um, MIDI clip sound like a human being played it. It's going to humanize it. All right, so uh, a few different options. Um, all of the MIDI, um, MIDI functions, uh, the automated MIDI functions have this kind of window. Uh, what this does is it allows us to customize the parameters uh, with which um, this can be randomized or changed. So if we look over here at position, this is the plus or minus random. So it's like a 10, a small like decimal of an actual 16th note. So it can move it ever so slightly. We could increase this if we wanted it to move more or decrease it if we wanted it to move less. Um, all right, so let's get that to 10. All right, um, and then over here, velocity and length. So this is, uh, we've already highlighted every MIDI clip. I prefer to work uh, with this. Uh, I don't like to hit select and operate because if you just happen to only really want to do it to part of the MIDI clip but accidentally hit that, does it to the whole MIDI clip, and if you don't recognize that right at the moment, it can be kind of hard to get that back. Um, not hard because it would be perfect, but annoying. All right, so operate only. We hit that, 
And notice um, the colors. I don't know if you can see that. The colors of this actual MIDI clip changed. In Logic, the color coordinates to, uh, corresponds to the actual velocity that's get the notes getting hit with. So um, the darker the color, the harder it's getting hit. The lighter um, the color, the softer it's getting hit. Um, so notice if we zoom in here and I look at the actual beat, some of these notes are slightly off. Well, that's a good thing because it's going to sound more like what an actual human being would do if they tried to play this. Um, you can uh, hit operate multiple times if you would like. Um, I had unselected, so notice nothing happened there. Got to grab them, hit operate, hit it a few times. Um, I I, I like doing that. I don't know if there's much to that, but it essentially makes it slightly more human each time. <laughs> um, let's hear what that did. All right, we just heard something. Do you hear that? Only one note's in the beginning? Uh, this is sort of an interesting thing about logic or just I guess the way MIDI works since some of these notes are slightly before our clip is starting we're not going to hear those so we have a few options we could uh, extend the track and extend the clip slightly forward then we'll hear them that's one pretty good option I could also uh, select them all and drag them proportionally back to each other um, what that will do is make it so that they're all on. So you can take the furthest one out, snap that to the, to the grid, then we'll hear the chord. All right, cool. So let's review that. Let's go to our drum kit. Let's uh, zoom out so we can see these notes. Let's select them all and let's uh, humanize our drum beat. Right, operate only. Cool. Now humanizing just gives us some cool movement here. All right. Now, since we're on the drum kit, let's talk about some of these other rhythmic functions. So, um, one thing that uh, a term that we need to address is called swing. Um, so, first of all, Quantization, uh, what this does it is allows us to snap or correct a performance that's either something we wrote in or played. Um, I can grab them all and if I hit quantize to the 16th note, it undoes that humanize element I just did. Now all the notes are perfect. All right, one important thing about quantize is you have to quantize the rhythm up here. It needs to be the smallest rhythm that anything is played. So like if I were, um, to have chosen a smaller rhythm, like say a quarter note, and I had to hit quantize, it would have moved notes to the the closest quarter note, which isn't actually what I want, since for instance, this kick is on an eighth note, or on an, a secondary upbeat eighth note, not on a quarter beat downbeat. Um, so that note would move to the left or right. Up here, uh, for certain styles of music, swing is very important. So what is swing? Um, one way I like to describe it, actually. So swing is, to play it for you, instead of the eighth notes being straight, as we would say, it would be like one and two and that's straight. Swung is one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And if you hear, um, most live grooves are what people are playing. Um, swing is definitely very much built into most grooves. All right, so let me just create a visual really quickly. Sorry, I should have done this ahead of time. <laughs> I'm drawing two gorgeous eighth notes. All right, so in music notation, this is how we write. Um, or probably the mirror image, to eighth notes. These would be straight now. Essentially, I like to think, what if I took those these eighth notes and grabbed them by the actual stem and swung them to swung, again, using the word, to the right or the left, they would move. Uh, 
this one might move to the right or to the left and they might be slightly less than perfectly even if that makes sense that's one visual uh, that helped me in the beginning remember what swung was um, so let's try to make these symbols swing now Back to our rhythms, I had said this uh, in the last video, but these are on quarter notes. So let's talk about the terminology of the grid really quickly. Um, right now I'm in 4-4 uh, four, four, and I have a 16th note grid. So what that means is every single little box is a, represents a 16th note. That's why there are 16 per measure where we have four quarter notes, four 16th notes per quarter. So that means every quarter note is four of these boxes. Uh, logic creates a slightly lighter or thicker line to for you to easily find those. All right, then the rhythm that is half a quarter note we call an eighth note. Um, if we had a, a note that were three boxes, uh, that's in classical music going to be a dotted eighth note or one and a half eighth notes, um, and so on. So since we have, uh, it's important to know what those are because we're going to need to tell our uh, quantization over here uh, what to actually swing. So I'm going to select them all. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to put quarter note. Why Why do I do quarter note? Well, if I leave this on 16th note and I start swinging it out, notice nothing happens. That's because it's swinging out the 16th that we would have. So if I swing that one, it would move, but it's not going to move uh, the notes that are on the actual down beats. Because again, when I did the rhythm, one, a two, a three, the one, two, three is consistent where it was originally. So uh, let's select all the symbols. I'm going to go to quarter note. I'm going to add some swing here. Now uh, we can go from zero to 100, and then we can have a different strength. Um, this is pretty cool because instead of going in by hand moving notes, I can put a little swing in. Now, just that much uh, really does go a long way. So zero, that's super straight. It's a little bit more vibey and swung. Now, if you want something to not sound digital like it came out of the computer, um, making it so that the rhythms, whether it's a drum kit or instruments, uh, making sure that they're not perfect is definitely one element to that, and swing helps with that. Um, scale quantize, I personally never use this. Um, as I'm going to get into, into uh, some of my future videos, I actually... Um, have a music theory text. The link is below us. Um, the, on a side note, part of my reason for doing the logic video is to describe all of the skills you'll need or uh, show you the skills you'll need so you can follow along as I show you some music theory. Um, but scale quantize, what it allows you to do is it allows you to grab something that's a uh, pitched performance. Uh, I could select these all and I could quantize them to a certain key. All right, now, uh, it is cool experimenting with all these automated functions. Um, my personal view on the scale quantize is that if you understand your scales and you use your ear, you're going to be able to write uh, music slightly more purposefully. You'll be the architect of what the sound ultimately is. Now, that being said, uh, I tell a lot of my students, the further you get in composing, uh, the more you have a need for not being the architect of what it sounds like. That uh, that being said, uh, uh, meaning if I only use certain influences and I write music from a similar perspective and I use the same skills and everything, um, I personally have begun uh, feeling like my stuff, uh, at least to me, starts to seem predictable and, and it, it loses somewhat of the fun when you're no longer a little bit... Uh, experimenting if that makes sense um and just for the matter of sometimes you don't have a specific melody in your mind that you want to write um 
the scale quantize or other arpeggiators automated functions can be really cool for that. All right, <laughs> speaking of arpeggiators, uh, let's actually do something uh, automated. I'll show you what I what I mean for that. I'm gonna duplicate this piano instrument. I'm gonna drag the MIDI clip that was currently down. We're gonna talk about the verse. I'm going to copy the piano over the keyboard that uh, I put the sustain pedal and humanized. All right, let's talk about arpeggiators. So um, you probably have come across, if you've done any producing uh, or playing on keyboards before, you might be familiar with the idea of an arpeggiator, uh, kind of a crazy word. It is uh, It comes from the word arpeggio. An arpeggio um, is a pattern of notes played uh, typically it is a broken chord so a chord um, a group of notes that together have the sound of a chord but are rather played individually arpeggios are very common in all styles of me of music um, from Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata uh, for at least to Zed's music um, arpeggios are are very very common um, they're they're cool because um, we know that they they function like chords right so if I were to arpeggiate the same chord sequence I have it's still gonna work but it's going to have some rhythmic it's gonna be somewhat melodic in nature and I'll show you what I mean um, so if I go up here just to showcase some of the abilities of logic i'm going to go over here to midi effects see that now if you don't see this window again these buttons up here open the windows i'm an inspector so inspector is where we add um, effects to our signal path or um, arpeggiators uh, or change the actual instrument or alter the pan besides being in the mix window all right so i'm going to open a midi effects now uh, we've got a few a bunch of different options here um, the arpeggiator is the one I use the most most commonly um, if I am trying to experiment with something um, some of the other ones are worth experimenting and uh, this will at least give you a taste of what these do so again the way all this routes I'm gonna open the arpeggiator um, is sort of that uh, we start at the instrument creating the the sound uh, we have the MIDI clip, but it's going to flow through this arpeggiator um, before it actually hits the instrument. So it's going to s alter the MIDI. Um, and then if we were to add effects, we could change that. So let's just hear uh, what happens with our chords. Um, let's turn those down a little bit, our arpeggiator and the beat. You get the idea. You probably heard stuff like that. That was pretty fast. Let's hear eighth note triplet. That was kind of a, a six eight feel. Let's try um, eighth notes. Pretty cool probably heard that now here's how this thing kind of works uh, we can change what the actual uh, patterns are we can add variations we can create more octave range different patterns to this. Syncopated chords.
<laughs> All right. Um, so how about we change the instrument? We experiment with one of Logic's other cool built-in instruments for this arpeggio. To do that, again, um, I can do that a few different ways. I can select an actual instrument. Now, these work a little bit different because these are the actual synthesizer VSTs built with Logic. Um, I can hit this file drawer looking button up here and it's going to open my library. Um, over here, these are slightly different because you'll notice when I select an instrument from a library, many times there are already effects built into said instrument. So um, let's go over here uh, to a synthesizer, a pluck, and let's hear what sort of things we can get Eastern Hammers. Now notice something there, what happened? Not arpeggiating anymore. Huh, this one. Some of these are pretty interesting. Now, um, one side note, I don't know if any of you uh, heard that, but some of those sounded slightly out of key. Um, in the synthesizer world, just because we write a C in MIDI doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a C. Uh, some synthesizers have something called fine tune, so we can alter the actual pitch and then certain um, synthesizers have the ability to detune actual oscillators which to me is what the sound we just heard so let's let's go with retro pluck and I'm gonna have to put up my arpeggiator again I had changed it to um, an eighth note and down all right um, let's see at this point uh, I want to sh address um, how we can make things change in the actual track so I don't know if you saw that but I was changing the actual volumes here um, change so the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna use automation so automation allows us to draw in changes of virtually any parameter on said instrument. We can do it a few different ways. Uh, we can actually write it in or, or touch it in by uh, doing it the old school way, uh, which is like basically recording the movement uh, that we make, or we can just do it by hand. So to access the automation lines, uh, we're going to click A. Notice that. Uh, brings up this based out line. Uh, it's going to turn yellow when I click on it. I can create uh, pivot points by clicking. The parameter here that I'm on is the parameter I'm changing. So I'm changing the volume. The, synthesis, the volume of this is going to start soft. Now let's mute this so you can hear it get louder. All right, so building in volume is one cool intro thing. Uh, let me show you another automation parameter I use in this context all the time. Um, I'm going to click on Retro Pluck. Now I'm going to add an EQ. Notice that there's an EQ already. Again, to reiterate signal chain, the actual sound we're hearing is a result of this arpeggiator altering the retro synth that is compressed then goes through an EQ, an overdrive, phaser, ensemble, delay, compressor, and into some buses. So all of these plugins are part of the sound we're already hearing, which means if I were to use the EQ that's already there, I would alter the sound um, from what it is, and that's not the effect I'm going for. So I'm going to go up here, I'm gonna uh, choose another channel EQ, just like with the one I have, I'm going to turn on the low pass or high shelf parameter. I'm going to roll it down 
172. While I'm at this, I'm going to just EQ out the low end. I'll talk more about mixing stuff in the future, but for the most part, if something isn't an actual bass or has subs that we actually want to hear, we want to automatically cut them off. All right, so this is going to filter out our pluck. Let's hear that. We barely hear that. So what I'm going to try to do is create this sound. All right, you probably have heard that a lot. Um, that is referred to as a low pass filter. So basically the reason for that is lower sounds are allowed, allowed to pass through. So you're cutting off the highs. I struggled with the terminology with that in the beginning because my brain just wanted to think like low pass, uh, low pass cut off lows, I guess. Since I have it now, that doesn't make sense either. <laughs> so um, instead of uh, draw or recording this in the way I would do that is I would change this from read to touch and then I could actually record the line um, this is actually let's do that um, it's useful because if you notice the other way I can do that is hitting a going to my drop down menu going to my EQ and then finding the parameter that is what I'm altering I know because I do this effect a lot it's the high cut frequency but if you aren't sure, and uh, this is really the use I have for touch, I'm gonna put this to touch. I'm going to start the audio, and I'm just gonna move the line, move the parameter I want to change. When I do that, notice on the actual um, MIDI or automation line, a new color showed up, and it started changing. That new color is the parameter that we want to change. So if I look up there, you know, ta-da, it is exactly the one I uh, said it would be high cut frequency. So if you do this a bunch uh, on, if you do similar sort of automation on certain instruments, like if you're doing uh, things within serum LFOs, you get kind of good with where to access those. Um, all right, so what this is gonna do is it's gonna create kind of an intro effect. Uh, let's un-solo that. Now, on a side note, uh, after we did the, we recorded the motion via touch over here, we put it back to read. It's pretty important uh, because if we didn't do that and we continued to mess with uh, moving things here, it's gonna continue to write an automation line. Uh, remember I said this, turn it back to read or else potentially gonna be out of automation, all of a sudden hit A and you're gonna have hundreds of drop down menus and uh, you're gonna have things changing and you're not gonna recognize that you actually automated a parameter to do that. All right, let's hear what we've got. I just moved the filter. It sounds kind of cool to do this. <laughs> uh, so my theory on why this has become extra popular in music of late, first of all, since we know it sounds good when it's fully in, uh, cutting out part of it as an introduction will kind of always work. Uh, but one of the other reasons for this is that um, DJing has become very, very popular for the last... I don't even know, like at least 10 years. Uh, we're in 2018 currently, uh, and it has been, I would say, the main mainstream for about 10 years now. Um, and in DJing, uh, artists blend two tracks together in uh, sort of simplified terms, and to do so, a lot of times when an artist is bringing in a recognizable melody from another track, they will filter it in. Now they'll either use a filter on the actual mixer board or, the, or they'll roll off highs, really common sound and it works in both settings. Um, I think this is gonna be where I wrap up for today. Oh, didn't mean to hit uh, save. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, this further introduction. <laughs> it's probably obvious by now, there's quite a lot to discuss with this program. Super awesome uh, because we have 
essentially a recording studio and a bunch of working session musicians at our fingertips. Um, just takes a little bit of practice uh, and uh, messing around to actually figure it all out. Um, I'll pick back up uh, here and we'll continue. Uh, we'll probably try to write a melody next time, um, do some of the destructive audio editing I was planning for today, and continue going. Um, as always, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email will be below. If you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, let me know what you think, and hopefully this was useful in the comments. And uh, if you're curious about my music theory text, um, the link is also below. All right, cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, happy producing, and keep making music. You know, it's meant to be fun, and uh, I hope this is something that, no matter where it leads you, uh, adds happiness to your day. Awesome. Have a great one.